Each amino acid is made of a central atom of carbon that is bound to four different groups. One is an atom of hydrogen. One is a carboxyl group, the same that we have seen at the terminal end of fatty acids. And then the other group is an amino group that contains nitrogen. If you think of carbs and lipids, there was no nitrogen in their structures. Proteins are the only macronutrients that contain nitrogen and are our main source of this element. So on top of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, amino acids also contain atoms of nitrogen. And then the fourth group, bound to the central atom of carbon, that we indicate here with the letter R, is called the side group of the amino acid and is variable. The bottom part here is always the same for every amino acid. Well, the side group changes, and it's what defines each of the 20 amino acids. For example, if the side group is just an atom of hydrogen, we have made the simplest amino acid of all, glycine. If instead of hydrogen we put there a methyl group, we have made alanine. And so on, we can build all the 20 different amino acids by changing that side group. Two amino acids, methionine and cysteine, contain atoms of sulfur in their side group. Three amino acids, valine, leucine, and isoleucine, have a branched side group. These are called the branched chain amino acids. Now that we have the amino acids, we want to build a protein. To do that, we have to link amino acids together with a peptide bond. A peptide bond is a covalent bond between the carbon of the carboxyl end of an amino acid and the nitrogen of the amino group of another amino acid. This is a condensation reaction with elimination of a molecule of water. Each amino acid can make two of these bonds, one on the carboxyl group side and one on the amino group side. And this way we can build chains of amino acids as long as we want. This process of building proteins from amino acids is what we call protein synthesis, and it happens inside most of our cells. The DNA inside the nucleus of our cells contains the instructions that are necessary to build proteins. You can think of it as a recipe book that contains the recipes to make all the thousands of different proteins that we may need to build. That is, the sequence of amino acids that need to be put together to make each protein. This information is read by the specific organelles in our cells called ribosomes, that translate this genetic code into the actual sequence of amino acids. If DNA is the recipe book, then the ribosomes are the cooks that read the recipe and follow the instruction to build the protein. Suppose, for example, that we are in the pancreas and we need to build insulin. We first open our DNA at the gene of insulin. Because our DNA is very precious, we don't give it directly to the ribosomes, but we first make several copies of the part that contains the instructions for insulin. These copies are called messenger RNA. It's as if we were opening our recipe book and making photocopies of the page with the recipe for insulin. Messenger RNA can then safely exit the nucleus and is read by the ribosomes that translate the code from DNA language to protein language and start building insulin by adding one amino acid at a time and binding them together one after the other in the correct sequence. The sequence of amino acids in the protein is what determines its final shape. So this linear chain of amino acids will then fold in the three-dimensional space to acquire a shape, but the way it does that is not random it is determined by the linear chain of amino acids itself. So once we have the linear chain of amino acids, there is only one possible way that it can fold in the three-dimensional space, and it depends on the sequence of amino acids themselves. The way they interact, they attract or repel each other, that makes the chain spiral, bend and curl until it acquires its characteristic shape. And this is very important because most proteins work only because they have a specific shape. So the final shape is what determines the biological function of the protein. But this shape is direct consequence of the sequence of amino acids of the linear chain just as it comes off of the ribosomes. To illustrate how this is important, 
Let's consider the example of sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease whereby the gene encoding for hemoglobin carries one little mistake. Hemoglobin is an important protein for our red blood cells so that they can efficiently carry oxygen. It is a big protein made of four chains of over 140 amino acids each. But because of the little mistake in their DNA, when individuals with sickle cell anemia build the protein hemoglobin, their ribosomes are instructed to place the amino acid valine instead of glutamine in position 6 of the chain, so one amino acid in place of another. But this is enough that the whole protein would then fold three-dimensionally in a completely different way, which is dysfunctional. And because the shape is what determines the function of the protein, this will result in a totally dysfunctional red blood cell itself. The whole structure of the red blood cell changes. What you see here is not just the protein, it's the whole red blood cell that has totally dysfunctional shape that is not as efficient in carrying oxygen. And this depends on the wrong shape of hemoglobin, which in turn depends on just one little amino acid put in place of another in a chain of over 140. This case exemplifies how important it is that the sequence of amino acids be the right one, and how this then determines the final shape of the protein, and how the final shape is important for the function of the protein itself. You can easily understand at this point that if a protein loses its three-dimensional shape, it will also lose its biological function. The loss of three-dimensional structure of a protein is what we call protein denaturation. It is basically the unfolding of the protein back to its original linear sequence. The sequence of amino acids may be preserved, but the function is lost. And this can be something that we do not want. For example, for the proteins in our body, our insulin that we just built, we don't want it to be denatured because then it will lose its function. But in other circumstances, protein denaturation is something we actually want. Think protein digestion. You already know that our goal with digestion is not preserving the function of proteins, we just want the pieces. One of the goals of protein digestion is precisely protein denaturation, because unfolding the proteins makes it easier to break it down to get the single amino acids that we can then use. There are several ways we can denature a protein. Exposure to heat is the easiest. If I cook an egg, its transparent and liquid albumen will become white and solid. And this is irreversible. If I cool it down, I will not go back to transparent and liquid. And this is the result of irreversible denaturation of the proteins of the egg white, induced by heat. In general, every time we cook food that contains proteins, we have protein denaturation, at least to some extent, which is a good thing because it will make digestion of those proteins easier. Other ways to denature a protein are the use of specific enzymes, exposure to high pH or low pH solutions, high salt concentration, agitation, high pressure, or specific denaturing agents such as heavy metals, guanidine, urea, or radiation. Again, let's think digestion. The strongly acidic environment in our stomach strongly induces protein denaturation. If you squeeze some lemon juice in milk, you will immediately see protein precipitate. That is a consequence of partial denaturation of kappa casein, one of the proteins in milk, caused by the acidity of lemon juice. When you make mayonnaise, you have to agitate to denature the egg yolks protein so that they can incorporate the little oil droplets. If you don't do that, you will just end up with a disgusting mixture of egg yolk and oil. If you don't knead, your bread will not rise. You need to denature the wheat's proteins first so that they can then create a protein network that traps air bubbles. Denaturation by heating, acidity or agitation has dozens of applications in the kitchen and it's one of the most fascinating aspects of food chemistry.